everybody, I'm Tom Vassell and welcome to Crowd Surfing. This is a bi-weekly show, although we've had three weeks since our last one because of Dice Tower Con. But this is a show where we talk about Kickstarter and all the different projects that are on Kickstarter. Always stuff going on, of course, we are now in the middle of the summer. And because the summer coincides with uh, convention season, there are lots and lots of Kickstarters because folks like to show them off at conventions. There's some pretty big ones on Kickstarter right now, so let's get started with the news. Now, my first project's ending really soon. In fact, um, it's going to be over like in a few hours, probably after you watch this. And that's the Geek On Ultimate Board Game Backpack. Now, this is a backpack that has tons and tons of interesting things. Like a, you put your sunglasses in the strap that goes around you like this. And there's all kinds of cool things in it. And it fits a ton of games. They show even Gloomhaven can fit in the backpack. That's what worries me about this backpack. If you watch the video for this backpack, they show you, hey, the guy's walking around, showing off the backpack. Ooh, look, it's a great, looks great. But when you fill that backpack full of those games, that's an incredibly heavy amount of games. And it's big and bulky. I had a backpack like that, a tank backpack, and every time I moved, I was worried I was gonna knock people over. And I just didn't find it as satisfying. But, I mean, maybe it will work. Maybe it's better than what I'm looking at here. It's just that it's interesting to me that, they, that they're talking about how the backpack is can carry a ton of games, but in almost every picture, then they show the person carrying it without them. And they're like, you can carry it on a plane. And I was thinking, if you fill that whole thing full of games, including Gloomhaven, uh, you're going to be, uh, you sure, it might be allowed on a plane, but the people around you might be a little annoyed. But hey, what do I know? It's making a ton of money. Pitch Storm. Uh, this is made by the same folks who made Super Fight. This is a pitching game where you're pitching a movie idea to some movie executives who keep interjecting, maybe we should add this type thing to it. So it's kind of like a party game where you're saying, I want to make a movie, a romantic movie about some people in the office. And like, but what if there's ninjas? Oh, okay. And you have to incorporate that into the pitch. Uh, from Newbie, we have Evil Corp. And this, is a, this is Newbie Games, which seems like a really odd name for a company. This is their first one. It's a take that style game. It has some pretty cool things like a really cool looking box and interlocking headquarters and you know the whole theme of being an evil corporation seems to appeal to people or teaching the lesson of being an evil, I don't know what the thing is. I wonder though, I look at the rules and again that hole where they lead off and say this is a take that corporation game. So this is what I'm gonna have to wait on and see. Flying Lemur has a game, Mike and Old's Solarius Mission, second edition. Now Solarius Mission, Again, I went and looked at the first edition, um, which is a 4X style game to explore the universe, build a space empire type thing. Um, it's the uh, complaints against the original game were that there was a lot of problems with the rules and that there just was the, the production wasn't that good. So the new, this new version says it's going to fix those, have nice clear rules, have really nice components. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, if it, it simply has a tough... A tough row to hoe because there are so many space games at this point in time. Then we have Rising for the Throne, the board game. This is made by uh, Tvarli, who's mostly made miniatures before. And this is a huge type Kickstarter, doing really well. You're trying to bring glory to your clan. There's a lot of cards and dice. Um, with some, I guess I shouldn't say it's a huge Kickstarter, but there's, uh, but there's a lot of there's some few miniatures in it and stuff, and it, it really looks like they are trying to rip off Game of Thrones. Maybe not, but the universe really looks similar to Game of Thrones universe, and maybe that's what they're going for. Modiphius is finally kickstarting Kung Fu Panda. I think they announced this like uh, two years ago at Essen. I, I really remember the big announcement, and I was very excited about it. I'm still excited about it. In fact, I'm kind of mind boggled why this one doesn't seem to be doing better. Kung Fu Panda seems like a strong property. It's a fun property. Works for kids and adults. Has cool looking miniatures. I love the. It looks like a fun game where you're picking action dice and doing things. I like the idea. This is one I'm really looking forward to. Combo Fighter. This is a game I actually uh, have played a demo of this game at Dice Tower Con. Combo Fighter is yet another game in the whole line of, hey, let's take Street Fighter and make it a game. This one may be the best I've seen in this genre. It's certainly the fastest. You have a deck of cards. 
You're going to play cards with rock, paper, scissors, try to outthink the other person. But once you beat the other person, you can combo, 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 combo. If you make certain combos, you have special abilities. You know how many cards they have in their deck of different types, so there's some strategy to the game. I was pretty impressed, especially how fast it plays. For once, we have a two-player fighting style game that feels like a two-player fighting style game. So that's neat. Uh, Coldwater Crown the Sea. This is an expansion of Coldwater Crown, the fishing game. A game that I actually regret not having played. Z did the review for a thing. I never got a chance to try this one out, but I'd like to. This one you can now go out to the sea and do deep sea fishing. Of course, if you're out there, you're not catching your freshwater fish. But uh, it, you know, it adds more fish and more things to the game and squid on the front of the box. Then we have Overturn Rising Sands. Overturn Rising Sands, sorry from Foxtails. This looks amazing. Like the initial picture here. Woo! A big city with miniatures and different buildings set in the Middle East. There's some cooperative nature to the game. I mean, just amazing looking. Uh, I'd like to know more about the rules and stuff to see how well this game is. I mean, again, it's doing really well, partially, I think, because it just looks so cool. Um, the initial reviews seem to be very positive on it, so that's one I'm keeping an eye on. Rec Raiders. This is a dice drafting game uh, from Kids Table Board Games. And they've made a lot of games that I've liked before. Josh Capel is one of the designers of this game. In fact, this is my pick of the week. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I like dice drafting. I like the idea of getting loot. But this game is just gorgeous. I, I mean, so it's, I'm not picking it for my pick of the week just because it looks pretty. But that definitely has about maybe 50% of it. looks great. I know it's a kid's game. I like dice drafting. It looks like there's a lot of really fun options in it. This is one of those games that if I saw it on my shelf, I'd say, let's play it right now. I'm really excited about it. So I am. I look forward to seeing this one come out. Shady, April, Shady Agents. Game of Friendship and Betrayal. This is made by some guys with a YouTube channel called Just Kidding. A uh, very popular YouTube channel, which they play games and do different things with their friends. So now they made this game. It looks like a game of kind of like one of those games where you tell a lie or a truth and people try to guess. Mixed with social deduction, so I'm not really quite sure how the game works together. But it, I, I'm sure the game is doing well because of their popularity of this channel. I wonder if the game itself is good or if it's just yet another one of those guess if I'm lying or not games. Edible Games Cookbook. Well, this is a unique thing. Um, this is from Jen Sandercock. Uh, I I like the idea of this a lot. Granted, I like food. And I challenge you to go and look at this Kickstarter page and watch videos and stuff without getting hungry. It looks really great. I don't know if the games are good. Now, she said she's a, a, a game design background and cooking background. The cooking one's very obvious. Her game design background's from video games. And a lot of these games that, so basically you make a game and food and stuff, then you play it, then you eat it. All right, I'm on board. Great. Um, they look more abstractish and stuff, but that doesn't mean that they're bad. So again, this is one I'm going to keep an eye on. Then we have Alchemal Best Cup Crystal. This is from a company who made Alchemal Crystal before. This looks like Mario Kart, plain and simple. Drive around tracks, shoot weapons at each other. There's a lot of games out there, but this one definitely is very pretty. Has nice miniatures and components and stuff, so I hope it's good. Star Tropolis. Now, this is an interesting game. This is a game that we actually considered for Dice Tower Essentials because I was so fascinated with how unique it was. One of the difficulties was getting the plastic miniatures parts for it, and since Sandy Peterson's doing it, the guys who make Cthulhu Wars, I don't think that would be a problem. Star Tropolis is a competitive game in which you are drafting different parts of a space station, but you're putting them all together. And so it's a 3D thing, and you're picking it up. So it's like a tile laying game, but in 3D, and you're picking up and rotating things around. I really love that concept, and I can't wait to see this one. Uh, PSC is making Ian Brody's Quartermaster General, The Cold War. I wasn't a huge fan of the, the Quartermaster General, although a lot of people disagree with me on this one. But I think I might like it better in the Cold War setting because it seems like it would work better. Uh, using cards to attack people in, in World War II didn't seem as interesting. Here, it might work better in the Cold War. Casual Games Insider Year 7. This is a magazine that gets better all the time. I just got the newest issue, read through it. They got a lot of great articles um, about casual games. It's still, still a little heavy on the advertising side of things, but I guess that's how the magazines have to stay in business. But if you want to read some good articles and learn about new games and see all... I mean, it's probably the best in-print magazine that's out there. Cthulhu, Death May Die. 
course, this is the next huge Kickstarter from Simon. Uh, Eric Lang and Rob Davio working together to make a game where you go through. It's a Cthulhu game, but this time you get to fight like a madman and shoot like a dungeon crawler with Cthulhu. And not only is it that, but there is a mega, I mean mega miniature. They showed a picture of it with a baby. It was bigger than the baby. You can see the picture here with the miniatures, how much bigger it is. This thing is giant. You don't have to get this, but it's like the final boss. A game where you can go in and whoop up on Cthulhu. I think a lot of people are going to like that. Dominations, Road to Civilization. This is a mixture of civilization type games and dominoes. <laughs> Although I really like how it looks. Um, there's card layout, you know, you're laying cards down in this panel in front of you. You're laying tiles out there like dominoes. It's made from Holy Grail Games, who's made some really spectacular stuff. The, the, the look of this looks great. So th again, it's another one that's really on my radar. Speaking of a game that missed my radar, NSKN is doing Snowdonia Deluxe Master Set. Now, NSKN is known for their really deluxe master set. Snowdonia is a train game, one that I never played. I probably should. I'll probably get this master set when it comes out. I like the idea of this. They going back and they found everything that's ever come out, every promo card, everything, and put it in one big set. So if you love this game, and this is a great way to jump in and get everything. Victory Point Games is doing Dawn of Zed's third edition. Um, Dawn of Zed's has been out for a while. Victory Point Games initially came out pretty much print and play type materials, but they keep getting better and better. So if you want like a big zombie style game, World War Z-ish in a sense, this is what you want to get. And then finally, from Colossal, Eclipse. Second Dawn. This is the second edition of Eclipse. I don't know how many changes that they've made. I know that they've not made a ton. Eclipse is a 4X space game, um, which, from my experience, leaned much more economic, but there's still a lot of fighting, a lot of things going on. And I thought the original components were not bad, but the new components are amazing. Colossal does a good job on this sort of thing. So very eager to see the final product here. A lot of big stuff this week in the news. Let's keep going. Hey folks, and welcome to another FOMO, the segment where I take a look at a game that's currently crowdfunding right now, and I haven't decided if I have a fear of missing out on it, and maybe you're in the same boat. Now today I am going to do things a little different, mostly because I'm just getting back from Dice Tower Convention, the greatest convention ever, and I just, I didn't have time to sit and go through some overviews. But I'm going to change one other thing this episode, and then I'm going to look at two games. The reason for this is I have two games that I'm currently looking at that both have a fighting sort of theme to them, but they are wildly different games. Now the first one is going to be Gorus Maximus. This is a trick-taking game with a gladiatorial combat theme on it. And the second game we're going to look at is going to be Combo Fighter. Now this is meant to emulate the old arcade style button mashing, but going head-to-head -head in a fighting thing. Now as to Gorus Maximus, it's a trick-taking game. It's, it, it's got some memories of maybe Bridge Euchre, and actually in talking to the guys that are making the game, I could tell they've played a lot of Bridge and a lot of Euchre. But what's interesting here is a few things. The first thing is the way Trump works in the game. In normal trick-taking games, you have the Trump suit, but you can't change that Trump suit. In this one, if I have suit, I have to follow. But if I can challenge the previous card by playing the same number in a different suit, I change the trump. And in fact, it changes it on a chart, and that's really important at the end of the game which one is going to be trump. Because in addition to that, the cards themselves have crowd favor on them, and that is the points. They could have none, they could have one, they could have two, they could even have negative four. So how you manage taking those in is really important. Another interesting thing here is that the game plays one to eight. You heard that right, one to eight. I've never seen a trick-taking game that plays one. I've had a few that play two, but I've definitely also never played a trick-taking game at eight. So overall, I really like this. If I had any hesitation, it's the artwork's maybe a little too gory for my taste, but I think that most people are probably going to enjoy it. Now as to Combo Fighter, Combo Fighter, as I said, is emulating an arcade style game. Now the thing is, this is a head-to-head -head game at its core rules, each player taking a fighting fighter and taking their deck. And it uses a, a rather simple paper, rock, paper, scissors sort of mechanism, but then it changes it out because while well, blue might be yellow, and yellow might be red, things like that, what happens is blue and blue are gonna cancel each other out. Both players take damage. Yellow, yellow are gonna cancel each other out and both take damage. 
Red and red, however, are going to then go on the initiative value. And what's interesting here is then if the player winning that hand has the cards in hand, they can then add combo damage or even create a signature move to do even more damage or change their stance. And another thing that I loved in this game is that the your deck, your hand of cards and your deck is also your health points. So if you run out, you're out of the match and you will lose. The game also has some variants for multiple players and they've fun from what I've seen, but really what I really enjoy this game is, is as a head-to-head -head game. And I love how each of the fighters feel so incredibly different that I can't wait to try out a new fighter. So overall, this is going to be my FOMO scores on these two games. And I hope that you have decided if one of these might be for you. I know that Gorus Maximus is in its last day as of the airing of this, and Combo Fighter has a little bit more time to it. And I look forward to seeing you folks next episode. So with Kickstarter, there's always controversy, I'm sure. And some controversy came up from with Cthulhu Death May Die. Now, this is the newest big Simon project. And it is from Rob Davieu, Eric Lang. It is a big miniature go fight Cthulhu style game. And in fact, you'll see some videos on our channel this week because they were both Rob and uh, Eric were at Dice Tower Con. And so they talked about this game and you'll see some of that stuff pop up as time goes by. So the way they did this Kickstarter is, I think it's a $100 pledge to get into Kickstarter. It's going to be delivered in the middle of 2019. Okay, fine. They also have this giant miniature. I mentioned it in the news, this humongous miniature. And this miniature is, I think, an extra 120 bucks or what have you. And you can get that the same month. Well, wait, actually, only the first 100 people did. The next 100 people will get it the month after that. And the next 100 people got the month after that. And the price also continued to rise. Now, expectedly, there's a lot of people complaining about it. Not so many that it's hurting the project. I mean, the project at this point is like one and a half million dollars. So seems like it's doing okay. But it almost, it didn't call it early bird, but brought back the early bird phenomenon. Now, I've talked about early bird before, and I'm kind of a mixed, mixed mind about this, and I'd actually like to, you know, hear back from you guys in the comments. See, I know why people don't like the early bird. It's a little bit frustrating, right? You go to a project, you open up the project, you're like, oh, that's the price. Oh, that's sold out. That's, oh, that's sold out. And so you feel like because you missed out on the project, then you get it for less of a price. The flip side to that is, is that if you were paying attention and you were doing it, you're like, hey, I was rewarded, I follow along. As Soon as the project launched, boom, I got it. I was able to get in there and get the cheaper price. And in this case, also the earlier delivery date. There's a lot of projects like that. I'm always very happy when I back a project and I'm in on the early delivery date, right? Like, woohoo, I'm getting this earlier than other people or, you know, or, or as early as possible. So I think sometimes it might fall to the way you feel about these is whether you did it or not, right? I got the early bird pledge, therefore I like them. I didn't get the early bird pledge, therefore they're stupid. I know it's not completely true across the board. Uh, I know for myself personally, I was like, well, I guess I'll back this. And when I went in there and saw that I wouldn't get that giant Cthulhu miniature till like halfway through 2020, I was like, eh, I guess I'll just wait then. And that, that's how I felt. But it wasn't like I didn't feel any like negative vibes towards the company or anything. I just thought, eh, I guess I'll just wait. But again, sometimes there's production things involved too. You can only produce so many things at once. And so I bet with this, I bet with this miniature that it takes a while to produce them. So they can't have a gazillion of them available in the first month. So, you know, what do you guys think about that? It's, it's just kind of a fascinating thing to me. Like I said, some people are very uh, annoyed about this sort of thing, and other people just take it in stride and think of it as a, hey, I was a backer of this. The other flip side to these things uh, is that when you have this, because there's no real transference system in Kickstarter. So let's say I'm one of the initial backers to get mine in the first hundred, and Joe backs the second hundred, and Susan backs the third hundred, whatever. So if I cancel my pledge, Joe doesn't move up, Anyone who just happens to be on the Kickstarter that day will get it. So you can imagine there's probably lots of people who are going to have to hover on this Kickstarter and watch and watch and watch. Did any of these open up? Did any of these open up? Did any of these open up? That one opened up, boom, backed it. So maybe that works then for the publicity of the Kickstarter itself, right? People are constantly going to the page. I don't know. What do you all think? Let me know in the comments. Hi, this is Jamie with Stonemeyer Games, and today I'm going to talk about behavioral psychology and how it relates to crowdfunding. 
Behavioral psychology is the study of why people act the way they do, often in terms of economics or pricing or consumerism, um, but it's much bigger than that too. There are two authors I highly recommend you checking out. They both have TED Talks and books. They're Dan Ariely and Daniel Pink, both fascinating authors who talk about a, a wide variety of studies and experiments about behavioral psychology. There are three aspects I wanted to touch upon today um, as they relate to crowdfunding and Kickstarter. The first is that studies show that seeing another human's face, whether it's a photo or a video, seeing their actual face can significantly increase empathy. This was shown in a study involving x-rays, people who were studying x-rays. If they saw the person's face next to the x-ray, they were actually significantly more likely to catch um, things that were wrong in the x-ray. So this relates to crowdfunding in that I highly recommend that you use a photo of your actual face um, as your personal thumbnail on the project page. And also make sure that your face appears in the project video and occasionally in project updates. Um, this can help backers connect to you and relate to you and empathize with you as a creator. The second element um, is that humans feel compelled to do things that are consistent with our stated intentions. If you say you're gonna do something, you're more likely to do it just because you said it. That's ingrained in your, in your head, in your psyche at that point. Um, and so this element of consistency can be used uh, for backers and, and for crowdfunding if you have a Facebook event leading up to the Kickstarter campaign that lets people say that they're interested in it or that they're going to attend, attend the campaign. Just by giving people that opportunity to say, yes, I'm gonna show up on day one um, can actually have a significant impact on whether or not they do show up on day one as a backer. The last thing is a twist on empathy. Instead of having backers relate to you and empathize with you, I think it's also really important for creators to empathize with their backers. This is something that I've run into on both sides of the coin, um, where sometimes someone might say something on a, camp, on a project page or during a campaign that, uh, that makes me defensive instinctively. And I've learned a little trick to get over that because getting defensive never works out well. Um, it, 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 I've never seen that work out well. So the trick that I've learned is that if someone says something and I, as I feel myself typing something that might be a little harsher than it needs to be, or something that might um, broaden the gap between us instead of bring us close, bring us closer together, is that I pretend that I'm writing an answer to my best friend. And as I'm sure you are with your best friend, you might say things differently to your best friend or your mother, your grandmother, someone that you have a lot of empathy for. You might say things in a much more relatable way, um, in a much kinder way than if you uh, are talking to a random person on the internet. So I highly recommend using that little trick in those moments where you might not show the best side of yourself. And by doing this, I find myself empathizing more with the other person, connecting with them, seeing them as a person rather than a few lines of, of angry text on the internet. So those are my three tips for behavioral psychology to, to increase the, uh, the connections, the relationships, um, and the number of backers that you have as part of your campaign, the number of engaged backers. Good luck. Hello there, Crowd Foundation. I always look for games that I can play with my family that are fun. Uh, you know, I play a lot of my daughter and my wife and even my daughter's friends and some of our friends that don't play board game all the time. And I was very excited when I saw a game called Racket Raiders. Racket Raiders is a worker placement game with set collections and kind of a bump strategy where you can kind of push some of the other players around. Uh, and that's it. Uh, it's very simple, very nice. Let me show you how it works. So this game has a dice drafting mechanics where you're gonna uh, take dice and you place your worker on locations that have a specific number roll on your dice. On your turn you pick a die from the die pool and then you send the diver to that spot. Now every time you put your worker on a specific location equivalent to the number of the die uh, you get to collect that treasure. Now be aware, if you collect a treasure with a diver from another player, that player gets to collect that treasure as well. So you want to try to get as much treasure as possible, at the same time avoiding to give treasure to other players. Now you can choose to go to the beach instead, and you collect items that they call the billballs. Those are like seashells, starfish and schools and other things, 
which you're going to try to create a set collection of that game. So each player will have their own board, uh, and where that board, you have two locations to choose to put your treasures. The tokens are double-sided, so you can choose to select a treasure and put that treasure on your display uh, from your exhibits, and then uh, at the end of the game you're going to collect points depending on the set that you can make it in there. There will be cards that will show sets that you have to accomplish. If you, anytime your uh, exhibit has those specific treasure, you get to collect that card, they'll give you a point. Now, the other option you have is to put all your treasures into your vault. So if you flip your token on the other side, you have unique treasures that will give you points as you complete each part of the vault. As you collect bubbles, you can spend them to new aquarium. So you'll be able to buy aquarium pieces, which you stack on your exhibit area. And you can stack them as high as you can. And those are really important because they're going to give you a lot of scoring points or a lot of coins at the end of the game. So they give you a lot of scoring opportunities as well, uh, as some of them can give you some powers. Uh, at the end of the game, all the players will add all the scoring or all the coins that they are going to get paid for their exhibits and their vaults and the player with the most coins wins the game. Love the title pool, so the way it works is like you roll the, the dice inside of the box of the game and there are spots where if the dice land on those little squares, those squares give you treasures as well, the ball balls, pill balls, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. So if you select that a specific die, uh, the player gets also that, that treasure. So I thought it was uh, even on the rolling uh, was kind of a, an interesting take on the game. And if that's the kind of game you're looking forward to, uh, don't forget to check it out. Racket Raiders uh, on Kickstarter right now. See you guys next time and keep funding those games. Well, that's it for another crowd surfing. Thanks to all the guys who uh, participated in this show. Thank you for all of you who watch. Lots of great stuff out there on Kickstarter. Have a lot of fun. We'd love to hear from you in the comments. Until next time, though, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Crowdsurfing on the Dice Tower.